believe about God? We've been studying theology. And we've defined theology as who we think God is, who we think we are. All right? So there are a number of interesting things that people believe, but only one thing that's correct to find in the Bible. Before we get started, let's pray one more time. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for each and every person here. Lord, I ask you to help me to preach the message you want me to preach today. Help me to say what you want me to say and get out of your way as you help people, Lord. Help us to learn more from your word and keep it with us after we've learned it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so actually, I brought a couple of things today because I had uh, a young lady call me yesterday uh, and ask if she could be baptized. And she didn't really know what that meant. She just thought that was the right thing to do. We talked for a few minutes. And they said they'd be here today and get to see them. So um, I had a couple things that I was going to bring up. But uh, the question is, what do you think God expects of you? If we look at God, who is the creator, and man, who is a created being, what does God expect of you? Some people think God expects you to be good, to behave, follow the rules. Some people think God expects you to uh, follow all of the traditions of men, to go to church and be baptized and do these things. What does God expect of you? Well, let's look in the Bible. Turn to John chapter 3. Into John chapter 3. It's a good place to start. <clears throat> Let's start in verse 12. John chapter 3 and verse 12. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. <clears throat> Pause right there for a moment. Now, verse 14 and 15 go together. Do you know how I know that? At the end of verse 14, there's a colon. Right. That tells me that the sentence has not been finished. So, if we read verse 14 and 15 together, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So, what is Jesus telling Nicodemus in these two verses? Who remembers the story of Moses? Okay, so, kids, I'll tell you a story. <clears throat> in Genesis, way back, many, many thousands of years ago, there was a group of people out in the and tell and stop me if you heard this one before. Uh, a group of people out in the desert, and they were not doing what God said. So God sent fiery serpents, a bunch of snakes, and this big group of people. When I say big group of people, there were millions of people camping out in the desert. And the snakes went and bit them, and they started to die. So they go to the man of God, Moses, and they say, "Hey, talk to God. We're all dying." The snakes are going to kill us all. And so Moses goes to God and says, what do you want me to do? And God says, make a serpent out of brass and put it on a pole and lift it up for everybody to see. And everybody that looks at the snake will live. Moses goes, <clears throat> really? Okay. All right. That doesn't... And so that doesn't make a lot of sense. We got too many snakes. You want to make one more snake? Why are we making extra snakes? But 
Moses did as he was commanded. He made a snake. He put it on a pole. He lifted it up. And sure enough, everybody that looked at it stopped dying and lived. And everybody that didn't, that was bitten, died. It's in the story. Okay, so why does Jesus, as he's the one talking here in verse 14, tell Nicodemus, he's the one he's talking to, that just like Moses lifted up that serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. <clears throat> well, the commandment was to look, turn your attention to what I have said, and live. And so Jesus tells Nicodemus, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's keep reading. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus came so that we didn't have to die in simple terms. Didn't send him to blame us for all that we've done wrong. Didn't send him to punish us or to, or to prove that we're bad. We, he had all the proof that we were bad that he needed. He sent his son to die for us so that we might live. Okay? So let's turn our Bibles and look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We'll start in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So Christ came and died in our place. Because we were guilty. So, what does God expect from us? He tells us in John 3 that we're to believe. What are we to believe? Believe in the Son of God. The Son of God paid for all sin. <clears throat> so, our, our salvation cannot be based in us. We cannot do anything to affect our salvation other than, what does it say in John 3? Believe. To believe. So just as the serpent had to be looked at, we have to turn our attention to Christ and trust that in Him is our salvation. Just a second, guys. I, I am uh, I'm completely going to split my sermon today and move in a different direction. God's telling me to move one way, and I'm prepared a different way. Amen. So while I read track here, just a second. Okay. All right. Here we go. Turn to Romans 10. Romans 10. So we know 
that we are commanded to believe. How does one believe? Words are one thing, but what does it really mean? We know that we're commanded to believe. Because in uh, John chapter 6, verse 40, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we're commanded to believe. All right. So Romans chapter 10, this is a, a, a popularly quoted verse, uh, passage of verses that is often misunderstood and taught incorrectly. So we're going to look at it very carefully. Verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Well, Israel was at this time the most religious country on earth. It says here that they have a zeal of God. They're religious. They're excited about it. But they don't know what to be excited about. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay? So what is God's righteousness? I'll take anybody. Christ. God's righteousness is found in Christ. Okay? So, they went about to establish their own righteousness. What, what did they think was righteousness? Words. Words. They were the Pharisees. They were the Jews. They went, to, let's, let's go follow all the rules. Did they follow all the rules? No. And then they thought, well, we'll get credit for trying. No. Um, one of my favorite movies is Pirates of the Caribbean. Not if you've seen it. Okay. One of the scenes is there's a pirate with a wooden eye. He's trying to read the Bible. And the other pirate goes, why are you reading the Bible? You can't read. He goes, it's the Bible. You get credit for trying. Mm. And they start a fight, which is comical in the movie. However, people think that. They think, oh, well, I get credit for trying. Folks, you get no credit. You can't do it correctly. If you, was that? But it's not about your credit. It's not about your credit, exactly. Uh, now, Ashley has some very special students in her classes. And some of them get credit for trying. This is not how it works most of you. But for the mic, if you go to a, a job and they pay you to put in the electrical system, all the conduit, all the wiring, all that, and uh, they say, hey, we need it by Thursday, and we'll pay you X number of dollars to have it done by Thursday, and it rains, and your shoulder goes out, and everything, your van breaks down, and everything goes wrong, and by Thursday, you haven't done anything. But you came to work every day and did your best. Do they still pay you? No! You don't get credit for trying. So we see here that the Jews were trying to establish their own righteousness. They were trying to do it their way. It says they have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. They have not accepted that Christ is their righteousness. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. What does that mean? That means once you see that Christ is kept the law for you, the law loses its power. You'll stop trying to keep the law. The law becomes unimportant in the face of what Christ has done for you. The end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord 
over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall, shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now I want to point your attention back to verse 13. So many preachers, Brother Mike, have said, if you will just come down here and kneel at this altar, and you will pray this prayer that I say, repeat after me. If the person that prays that prayer thinks that that's what saved them, thinks that their effort in that had anything to do with their salvation, they're twice as lost as they were before. We cannot, through word or deed, grasp our salvation. It is not found in us. It is not found in the words we speak or the prayers we pray or the deeds we do. Where is our salvation found? In Christ, in Christ alone. It is, we must look up to Christ as the serpent was raised up in the wilderness and the people that wanted to live had to look and take their focus off of themselves, off of their pain, off their, off their dying. People had loved ones dying in that field that day. And they had to leave them and ignore them if they wanted to live. And they went and saw the snake lifted up and lived. Folks, we have to ignore all that we have been, that, that weighs us down, all that we might believe in other than Christ, and look only at Christ for salvation. So, what does it mean here? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, it explains. It doesn't end there. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? It says, okay, you believe before you call. And how shall they believe if they've not heard? So you've heard before you believe. Folks, I have heard preachers say that they walk up to somebody that didn't know anything about Jesus, had never heard the name before, and got them pray a prayer and they said okay now we say it I go on do we see that anywhere in the Bible no. is that anything like Christ's ministry where he goes up and says hey just, just say my name is that what Christ did no what does he tell all of them what is, what is his universal explanation just believe on him whom he has sent some of them go, okay, now what? What, what? You have, you have my attention, now what? In other words, I don't get it. In other words, there's so many of these disciples that said, I'll follow you, now what? He says, take up thy cross and follow me, right? To come and learn of me. What does it say in, uh, I wrote this down. I am meek and lowly, and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. My brain's shut down. But he didn't tell people just, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna immediately believe everything and you're fine. He said, hey, come learn and believe of me. Pay attention to Christ. Can you understand salvation if you don't understand your need for it? No. So if you think you're all right, if you think that you have no need of Christ, are you going to trust him for your salvation? No. So the believer first realizes that they are the sinner. The believer first realizes that they are in dire need of a Savior. No one has ever trusted Christ thinking, this is my backup plan. So... Turn to, let's see where we go. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. 
back up a little bit. We're in Romans 6. Back up to Romans chapter 5. Find verse 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Okay. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Who's that? Adam. Adam, correct. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Thanks, Adam. Good job. Really messed it up for the rest of us. No, we messed it. If we were in Adam's shoes, we'd have done the same thing. Why? Because that's our nature. That's who we are. We are sinners. Verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. What does that mean, from Adam to Moses? Well, God gave Moses the law. Moses wrote it down. So he's saying, okay, if your job was to keep the law, what happened from all from Adam to Moses, all of those people that didn't have the law written out? God just judge them for not knowing? He says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude or in the same way that Adam did. Verse 15, but not as the offense, but so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. In other words, if Adam did something and you have to pay for it, how much more does it work? How much better is it that Christ did something and you don't have to pay for it? That's what this verse means here. Not as the offense, but so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of, is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which <clears throat> receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. In other words, if one man's sin could ruin it for all mankind, how much more can the Son of God fix it for all mankind? Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, folks, God didn't give us all these rules for us to keep so that we could be good by keeping the rules. He gave us the rules to show us that we were incapable of of anything good that we cannot make our own righteousness before God and that there's no hope in and of ourselves folks that day in the camp of the children of Israel I'm sure there were some talented doctors some physicians some herbalists some people that were used to dealing with poisons did anything any of them did that day do any good Man, it's time for a career change. They could not help. Why? Because it was of God. And I'm sure that there were people that thought, I'll fix this, I'll figure this out. I'll come up with an antidote, or I'll do something. I'll cut it out, I'll suck the poison out. Instead of going to see the serpent. That's not what God said. God didn't say, we'll figure it out yourself. Thank God. God didn't tell us, well, figure it out yourself. He says, ah, I don't want you to figure it out yourself. I figured it out for you. I gave you the solution, and here it is. You got to read it and learn the solution. Trey, you told me you like math problems. If you get a math problem wrong, can you just say, well, 
2 plus 2 is 5, and I believe that 2 plus 2 is 5, so I'm going to write 5 in. And because I believe it that way, that's the way it makes it. Does that, does that make sense? You get a good grade on that? Did your teacher find that funny? No. no. Folks, that's what we do to God. We say, you require this? Okay, well, I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to come my way. I'm going to, I'm going to live how I want. I'm going to do this, and this is my salvation. God goes, 2 plus 2 is not 5. You can't just write in the answer and say that's the way it is. There is a truth, an absolute truth of our condition before God, and there's an absolute answer. Don't ever argue with scientists about absolutes or terrible. You want, you want to talk to someone about, I talk to people about relative morality and relative truths. and rel yeah, we, can, we can muddy the waters on anything. Give us five minutes, an engineer will argue, argue to death. But there are some things that no matter how irritating we can get, we can't fix. We can't change. Gravity's one of them. What goes up must come down. If you hit something really fast, Brother Kevin, does it break? Two plus two is still four, right, Trey? Yeah. Okay, good. Teaching you something today, right? Because teach me two plus two is absolute truth. The truth is the truth. Two plus two is always going to be four, whether I believe that or not. Now, fortunately, my mother was my teacher, by the way, if you didn't already know this. My mother was my math teacher. And she says, two plus two is four. Well, when you're a kid, you go, okay, I'll go with that. Two plus two is four. But is that how we, we learn anything in life? We just go, oh, you said it? Fine. That works out well. Up until about the point in time that somebody tells you something that's not true, and you believed it. Now, I know parents never do that. My parents tried very hard, you know, they didn't, they didn't tell me, there's no Santa Claus by the way, sorry. Uh, they didn't tell me that Santa Claus existed. I believe that anyway, even though my parents never told me that. Well, it was very disappointing when I realized I was wrong, but I've been told by adults that Santa Claus was real. I believed in him. Does that change the absolute truth? No. Folks, what you believe is not important. Who you believe is far more important. Who you believe in. Christ said, believe in me. Believe on him whom he has sent. Let me see if I have anything else on this. Okay, so, one final note here. This is a bit of a tangent, but we're still talking about theology. We're still talking about what we believe. Who we think we are, and who we think God is. Now here's a question for you. I like the term sound theology, not right theology, correct theology. I prefer the term sound, sound theology, and there's a reason for that. The word sound, does it mean the sound of my voice? In this context, the no. definition is, Trey Hope, do you know? What does sound mean, other than what you hear? Okay, how's your guess? All right, no, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Do you know what does sound mean other than other than sound waves? Okay, all right. I'll give you the answer. Now you're about to learn something. Y'all ready? Sound means whole, like a whole cookie in whole. It means entire, unbroken. Sound means complete. Undecayed, right. not defective, as in a sound ship that sails without damage. Unhurt, as in sound body. Healthy, not diseased, as in a sound state of health. Founded in truth, firm, solid, valid. Cannot be overthrown or refuted. As in a sound reasoning, a sound argument, or sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. Folks, I want you to look in the Bible and find sound theology. What is theology? Simply the knowledge of God.
base your knowledge of who God is and the work of Jesus Christ as your Savior on the Word of God, and it is sound. It is unrefuted and cannot be overthrown. Salvation is assured through <clears throat> belief in Christ. We know this not because Josh stands up here and tells you, or because some really old wise guy comes up here and says things to you. We know this because we have the word of God, and he says, believe on Jesus Christ, and you'll have everlasting life. Let's go ahead and pray today. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity to come learn more about your word. Lord, I pray that you be with these people. Keep us safe and bring us back next week.